Welcome to this, I guess, is it this the final? Um, okay, the final uh, major symposium this year um, is also part of the series on citizenship and the presidency of democracy. And um, this has been an exhausting year for our <laughs> um, And so I hope you all were able to get away for the break and just recover a little bit before we head, head headlong now into the final half of the semester. Um, I've been asked to produce, introduce our speaker today, and it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Grant Barrett this afternoon. I have to say right up front, that is actually a challenge to introduce someone like Grant Barrett because he has been such an accomplished and prolific scholar. Originally from South Africa, Professor Farad obtained his BA from the University of the Western Cape, his MA from Columbia University, and his PhD from Princeton University in 1997. As an author, he has published three books, Mid Midfielder's Moment, obviously I am not a star <laughs> Midfielder's Moment, Color Literature and Culture in Contemporary South Africa, published by Westview Press 1999, and this book actually received the Choice Award in 2000. Um, What's My Name? Black Vernacular Intellectuals, published by the University of Minnesota Press 2003, and Long Distance Love, A Passion for Football, published by Temple University Press in 2008. He has published over 70 articles in a wide range of journals reflecting his broad and varied interests in literature, political thought, historiography, globalization, cultural studies, and sports. And they have been published in journals such as Social Text, Research in African Literature, Disposition, Journal of Sport and Social Issues, Contours, a Journal of the African Diaspora, and Cultural Studies Review. He has 30 articles in edited collections, the most recent being The Uncanny of Olympic Time, Michael Phelps, and the End, maybe, of Neoliberalism. <laughs> and that's in Sport and Neoliberalism, edited by Silk and Andrews, and that came out last year from Temple University Press. He has edited two collections, including Rethinking C.L.R. James, which was published in 1996 by Basil Blackwell, and five special issues of the journal South Atlantic Quarterly. In his downtime, he organized numerous conferences, including two held here at Cornell since he joined the faculty in 2007. And those were the Conference on Academic Freedom in 2009 and Theory Now in 2010. Over the years, Professor Farrell has garnered numerous awards and fellowships, including the Fulbright, the John Hope Franklin Fellowship at Duke University, and the Du Bois Rodney Mandela Fellowship at the Center for Afro-American and African Studies at the University of Michigan. Um, I'll just interject here that we actually met at the University of Michigan that year because I was on another fellowship. <laughs> um, and not one to rest on his laurels, Professor Farrell currently has three books in progress, including Violence In and The Great Lakes, The Thought of B.Y. Mudimbi and Beyond. So please help me to welcome him today as he speaks on Homeland, Autoimmune America. sign on Monday evening which said um, that Professor Bygale's accomplished sister um, not to be mistaken for Professor Bygale who will be away from us next year so I take every opportunity to um, give all of our time. Um, but I was hoping the sister would be talking today so I could in good faith tell Professor Richardson that there's no need for me to do this. Um, <laughs> but it's just like Professor Bygale to undermine me. Um, thank you Jay. I really appreciate the introduction. It's the kind of thing you want to um, remember and then send to your mother. No, your mother won't believe you. Um, 
So thank you very much, and we thank you for sending the conference, Professor Richardson. Um, I will try and um, I will try and sketch out some issues, and I won't. There will be very few stuff off the cuff, so I'm going to read this paper. Again, there's a new title. It's called um, "An American Has Been Turned: The Autoimmunity of Homeland." Uh, the opening quote is by Jacques Derrida from Rhodes, two essays on me, on reason. The Boyou and the Rue introduce disorder into the street. They are picked out, denounced, judged, and condemned, pointed out as actual or virtual delinquents, as those accused and pursued by the civilized citizen, by the state or civil society, by decent law-abiding citizens, by their police, sometimes by international law and its armed police, who watch over the law and over morals over politics, over politesse, over all the paths of circulation. It's Derrida, this is me. The sign of Interstate 405 in Southern California was cryptic, but full of foreboding. It read very simply, and I quote, they could be your neighbors, unquote. The sign flashing on a giant electronic billboard was inspired by the television show 24, the dramatization of America's post-9-11 fears about the imminent attacks to come. The they in question, those potential neighbors, refers to sub suburban Americans, a Muslim family to be precise, who supported Islamic terrorists in season 2 of 24. Of course, secret agent Jack Bauer, 24's boyish hero, Bauer takes no prisoners, and he also takes his punishment, we might say, like a man as he finds himself beaten up, tortured, subjected to some form of pain in every season. Of course, Bauer tracks down the Islamic terrorist and he neutralizes the threat, just in time, as always. Jack Bauer is a particular kind of boyu. In a post-9-11 America, always on the edge of disorder, he is the boyu Bauer, the patriotic American who can barely be tolerated by the state, by the state security apparatus in fact, he all too often operates from outside of it. Yet he is indispensable to the state's project of keeping America safe from terror. Bauer alone seems capable of securing the nation and of restoring order, if only temporarily. It matters not where or whom the threat emanates from. Islamic terrorists from the Middle East, slick spies from the Middle Kingdom, who are no slouches when it comes to torturing their enemies or utterly unscrupulous, megalomaniacal warlords from Africa intent on acquiring chemical weapons. Before it is too late, Bauer will save the day, always in his own inimitably voyeurish way. Bauer's voyeurish style is a heady mix, deriving as much from his own ingenuity and apparently endless resourcefulness, a sort of anti-terrorist MacGyver of the high-tech, high-stakes variety, as from the unfailing aid of a few security apparatus insiders who know Jack's true value, his intelligence value at the very least, to the state, the state that is all too willing to, and I quote, denounce, judge, and condemn him, end of quote, for his indiscretions, his overzealous pursuit of America's ever multiplying list of enemies. His routine flouting of America and international law, and above all else, his utter ruthlessness. Jack Bauer is above nothing, not even decapitating suspects at CTU, the counterterrorism unit's headquarters. Every boy you it would appear as he or as his or her lawyers, partisans inside and outside the state, committed to the boy you's cause, a commitment over which the state has absolutely no control. This East Derrida recognizes in Rhodes part of the boy you's literary charm. The voyou might be apprehended, incarcerated, denounced, judged, condemned to death even, but the voyou can never be eliminated. The figure of the voyou belongs fully to autoimmunity because the sovereign cannot immunize itself from the voyou's effects. By the standard of judgment, Jesus the Christ is unarguably the ultimate voyou, the final inaudible warning to the sovereign state, and he will come again in glory. Jesus the Christ will come again, this time with a power that exceeds the sovereign, because his power extends over life and death. This is a power, the power over which the sovereign has no power, first recognized by Socrates in Phaedo, 
a dialogue in which, faced with his own impending imminent death, and also the birth of philosophy, of course, he sets forth his theory of ideas and expounds on the immortality of the soul. In the world of Howard Gordon and Alec Ganser, co-writers of 24, those Islamophobic days that flash so hauntingly on Highway, 20, highway 4 or 5 now seems, from the sovereign state's point of view, nostalgic. The thinking that girds they could be your neighbors belongs to an earlier, simpler time in post-9-11 America. A time when America's enemies could be known through and by their otherness. 24's Muslim America is the, is the Muslim who bears not only the otherness of Islam, but is clearly embraced. 24's Muslim family is unmistakably brown, with roots that can be traced to the Middle East, or perhaps Asia or North Africa. Gordon and Gantz's new project, Homeland, makes 24's threat to the sovereign state a sentimental anachronism. They could be your neighbors, if only. If only the enemy, even the neighbor as the enemy within, to resuscitate Enoch Powell's bloody language of post-imperial Britain in the 1960s, was still so easily identifiable. If only things were so simple. The truth is, in Homeland, which Howard and Gantz have co-write, Matters of domestic terror have moved way beyond the kind of surveillance or recognizability of 24 Muslim neighbors. In homeland, it is infinitely more difficult to know who the enemy is because the enemy can no longer be named with any confidence other. Unless, that is, the other itself is subject to a thinking that extends beyond the extant category of other so as to evacuate other of any political standard, at least other as we know it. The political categories that obtain in 24 is rejected in Homeland. Instead, Homeland demands a new political thinking that begins with the premise that the other is not knowable. All thinking of the other must begin with the self. More pointedly, the self as it has not been thought before, which means, in, Homeland, in Homeland's terms, that the Muslim must be approached as that figure that has not been thought before. In Homeland, the Muslim is encountered not as other, but as a far more insidious incarnation. The, mu the Muslim is presented as the autoimmune white self. It is on this jarringly, utterly disrupting note that Homeland opens. The show begins with a bracing declarative, all the more bracing for its incomprehensibility, its unthinkability in post-9-11 America. An American has been turned. CIA intelligence, disputed by almost everyone in the organization except for one field agent, Kevin Matheson, learns that an American prisoner of war has given himself over to the other. The self, having been turned, is now <coughs> taking the side of the other from within the homeland. How does the nation whose thinking of the threat against its sovereignty is geared toward the other, the nation that believes in reserving its sovereign violence for the other, radically shift course and configure the self? as a threat. It, and yet, if an American has been turned, what choice is there for the nation but to engage and to think itself as a threat? The turning of the prisoner of war means that the nation must now turn and face itself. And in that turning to self-critique, itself a form of autoimmunity, Derrida warns in wrote, because of, because of that turning, any turn toward the other requires a reorientation a thinking against the existing modes of an understanding the other. Of course, the other remains a threat, but now the other must be approached first it, as itself and then as a complementary figure. There will one dare not say secondary threat. The other now stands in an intimate relationship to that other unknown figure of threat, the self turned other. How does one approach the self through the other if there has always been a distinction between self and other? And if all this turn is not enough to make one ideologically dizzy, putting one's head in an ideological spin, there's <coughs> a further turn, a twist, to complicate matters. The intimacy between other and autoimmune self must be apprehended through or as love. What happens when the self is turned because of love? Turns and finds the other's love. The other there offering the self its love. How does one think a turning that has been turned to out of nothing less than love, out of something so profound yet so everyday, so tender yet so remarkable as love, love of the other, idealized on the part of the 
man who has been turned, idealized love of nation, love of the son who is not a son except through language. Homeland, this presentation argues, is unthinkable except as a thinking that begins with the voyou that leads directly to the thinking of democracy and sovereignty, all of which turns in the first and last instance in their relationship to sovereignty. So the second section again, Derrida, the terrorists are sometimes American citizens. Me. In the autoimmune logic of homeland, they could indeed be next door, but only with a paradigm shifting caveat. They would be encountered not in the guise of the race Muslim family, but as a politically distinct modern family of sorts. The Brodies of suburban Virginia are an ideologically mixed family, an ideologically mixed U.S. military family, no less. The father, the father Sergeant Nicholas Brody, who goes only by Brody, returns to their modest suburban home after eight years as a POW in Iraq. During his captivity, not all of which is endured in a cell, Brody has been turned by an Al-Qaeda leader, the terrorist mastermind Abu Nazir, in more ways than one. The practicing Christian Brody of the moderate variety, nothing fundamentalist about his Virginia church, has been turned from a white U.S. Marine fighting terrorism in the Middle East to and into an observant Muslim. Well observed, up to a point. He prays at least once a day, but he still enjoys a drink. Without a habit or desire to dissemble and maintain his facade so as not to arouse suspicions about his otherness, that remains unclear. Again, we are unsure as to what to make of Brody's homeland faith. Is it strategic? Is he just performing the pieties of the Christian faith? Or is he simply an equal opportunity monotheist, as it were, praying to Allah in his garage, protecting the sanctity of his Quran with whom his wife Jessica defiles it after she finds out about his conversion to Islam, all the while showing his allegiance to God the Father and Jesus the Christ in power. After making great accommodation for him, Jessica Brody, who goes only by Jessica, finds herself exasperated by her husband's behavior, his unpredictability, his nightmares, his alienation, and his violence in their lovemaking after his return from captivity. Jessica rages into the ontological question, who are you? The interrogative is all that is left to Jessica. Hers is indeed an interrogation of Brody. The subjection of her husband to an intense critique that draws into question who he is and what happened to him over there. What happened over there to make her untenable, domestically unlivable, not only for them, but for her two children? In this way, what Jessica's interrogation draws into question most pertinently is the very fundament of their marriage, now rendered precarious and, one imagines, finally unsustainable. What Jessica's interrogation brings firmly into view is homeland ontotheological. The ways in which the secular project, democracy, and its fight against terrorism is always, whether this is acknowledged or not, grounded in the religious. More specifically, it is grounded deeply in Christianity. If the terrorist is, as Derrida argues in his critique of U.S. reason in the wake of 9-11, always potentially the American citizen, then Jessica's question is simultaneously philosophically misguided, in Heidegger's sense that the standing of the question can only be attributed to that inquiry that does not already know its answer. So I'm going to argue that Jessica knows the answer, but that's not important. So a question is both simultaneously philosophically misguided and politically what is the spouse to do when the answer to her question, who are you, is not a noun, but a compound verb adjective? Terrifying. That's the answer. He is terrifying. That is, who Brody, that is who Brody is, can only be answered as, he is that figure of the autoimmune who is terrifying in his being, terrifying to the domestic, the Brody family, and terrifying to the nation's polis. The question, especially the ontotheological question, is always, as Heidegger pointedly suggests in the principle of reason, already an answer. Or more precisely, the question is at once a political accusation and an indictment. To be, question, to be so questioned is the fate of the voyou, after all, to always be suspected of sowing discord in one form or another. And Brody is, we should make no mistake, a voyou. 
Jessica's greatest fear resides not in her question, but in the fact that she, a priori, knows the answer. That is what is truly terrifying. That instills an unimaginable autoimmune terror in the self. Who her husband is now terrifies her. The answer that Jessica knows is, you, my husband, have become an Islamic terrorist. You are a threat to me, to our children, to our family, to this nation. It is in the very lack of ambiguity that the catastrophic, shattering effects of the answer is to be located, both to the polis at large, whom the boy you threatens absolutely, and more pointedly, to those who inhabit the same domestic space. In truth, what Homeland Ben's Derrida's critique of, in, of autoimmunity in Rhodes is the dramatization of autoimmunity's full domestic effects, the complex of ways in which it insinuates itself into the most mundane aspects of domestic life. Homeland locates autoimmunity in the home, in two key senses. It grounds autoimmunity in the everyday activities of white suburban America. The television show demonstrates the intricate, intimate, and overburdened links that are forged between being at home and belonging, being in the homeland. The home and the nation are shown to belong in and to one another in such a way as to intensify, increase, and just occasionally counteract the vulnerability of one to the other. Autoimmunity of the domestic variety reveals itself vulnerable to the love of the family. Having succeeded in trapping the entire leadership of the United States in an underground bunker, president, vice president, secretary of state, they were all there in a bunker, one presumed safe by the nation state, by the, by the state's security apparatus, Brody is dissuaded at the very last moment from detonating the bomb he has on his person. This is all done because of a conversation with his daughter. It is the CIA agent Kerry who forces Brody's daughter, Dana, to make the call to her father because she knows that it is only his love for her that can triumph over his willingness to act in an at once suicidal, the sense of destroying the self, and autoimmune fashion, that is, destroying every organism that protects, that immunizes, that keeps the self alive. Kerry is able to manipulate the situation, one that threatens the state and the entire democratic world by extension, because she understands without casting it in these terms, the key principle of autoimmunity. The autoimmunity of autoimmunity. Autoimmunity is not immunized against itself. At the very least, it is not immunized against love, the love of the daughter. Is love the only true autoimmune force in the world? Derrida subjects us the concept of autoimmunity, as well as democracy and sovereignty, to a rigorous thinking in Rhodes, intensifying and expanding, turning the concept again and again so that new possibilities appear with every articulation. Consistently at its core, however, is the threat of destruction to the self, suicide, which is of course the core of autoimmunity. And I quote from Derrida, the strange illogical logic by which a living being can spontaneously destroy in an autonomous fashion the very thing within which it is supposed to protect itself against the other to immunize it against the aggressive intrusion of the other, end of quote. The greatest threat of autoimmunity is unquestionably its willingness to autonomously destroy itself. What terrifies Jessica, however, is its inexplicability, the question of the why. In this regard, Jessica is of the Heideggerian <coughs> persuasion. Heidegger says, in the principle of reason, nothing is without a why. Jessica wants to know. Why did this happen? How did this happen? Her husband left for Iraq a Marine and returned a Muslim terrorist. Jessica wants to know what her proximity to autoimmunity means. She fears, above all, the contaminating effects of living with autoimmunity. Seen in this light, Jessica's question to Brody is also an interrogation of her own ontology. Who am I? Who am I in relation to this, to this terrorist? What happens to those who are around the one who has been turned? How does one look with terror? What does it mean to be intimate with, to have been intimate with, to have loved and been loved by, to have made a life with the terrorist? What happens to the life before terror? Is it now as though it were an ideologically unconsummated marriage? What standing does the life, the love, 
before autoimmunity have? What status do the children born of that wife have? These are all questions and others, no doubt, that are compacted into Jessica's single ontological inquiry. How are these questions to be addressed ontologically? It is for this reason that Jessica's is a question that Brody cannot, Quran in hand, answer. Hers remains, however, the question of record. It is the question that goes to the core of a difficulty that a figure such as Brody presents to the American public. To be turned is before all else a question. To be turned into what? Into whom? To have turned from what? What was that what? Was that what ever properly thought or understood, especially in the moment of turning, but also in its own long life? To have turned against what? What, and there must be so much, both articulable and reason, as well as unspeakable and unthought, that takes place in the process of being turned, of turning the self into another self. Are these selves reconcilable, we ask? The Du Boisian timbers, which turns us toward Socrates' contemplation on souls, ringing <coughs> in our ears. Can a self be sloughed off by the outer layer of a Laurentian snake, given up, forgotten? Who is the self to the self in the act of turning? What does the self do to the self, do to itself? What is there but violence in such a turning? Is the only name for the self that is and is not self other? These are all questions that emerge out of autoimmunity, questions that appear beyond Brody's frame of ontological reference, but which emanate from the act of turning. All that Brody seems to grasp about his turning is, for want of a better term, its politics. He has committed himself a giving over that he can only apprehend as conversion, to using his newfound status, because when he comes back he's a national hero, in the course of furthering Abu Nazir's project. He understands, although he often acts only reluctantly, especially when he knows that his actions will result in excessive violence, that is, civilian death, how to mobilize, he understands how to mobilize in Nazir's cause his status as the Marine who stood tall in the face of Islamic terror. Above all, Brody knows that his commitment to Nazir, a Bin Laden-like figure, will remain nothing less than exacting revenge on his homeland. An American has been turned. For the sovereign state, this is the greatest threat, because there, quote from Derrida, there is absolutely no reliable prophylaxis against the autoimmune. The self cannot be immunized against itself. The self is vulnerable to nothing so much as itself. The very thing the self, which would logically be presumed before all else to protect itself, reveals itself to be dedicated to its own destruction. There is no protection against that. The self shows itself to be virtually capable, and I'm quoting again, virtually capable not only of destroying itself in suicidal fashion, but of turning a certain death drive against the autos itself, against the absurdity that any suicide worthy of its name still presupposes." End of quote. The self is, above all, prepared to give up its own selfness, as Derrida says, turning a certain death drive against the autos itself. For Derrida, as Jessica senses, autoimmune exceed, autoimmunity exceeds suicide. Autoimmunity is an act against the ipsaity, the selfness of the self, not simply against the self. It's the very thing that gives us being. It is precisely the selfness that suicide, the violent act against the self, still presupposes. Suicide, in other words, can be reasoned with. In, despite the violence of the act, suicide holds ipsaity in regard. Suicide seeks to destroy itself, but autoimmunity is aimed at the destruction of the entire organism. In Derrida's deliberate phrasing, autoimmunity stands by itself, distinct from suicide, because it seeks to turn a certain death drive against the others. The selfness of the self is that which exceeds the self. It is that which autoimmunity and autoimmunity alone seeks to destroy. The difference between suicide and autoimmunity is that the former seeks, if such a risky pronouncement might be permitted, to preserve obscenity even as it destroys itself. That's suicide. 
Autoimmunity, which is structured as a promise, the very thing that keeps you alive can also kill you. Autoimmunity threatens everything, beginning but by no means ending with the self. There is no prophylactic. Derrida is clear against autoimmunity. This means that unlike suicide, which can be reasoned, that is, a reason can be found, suicide can be explained, autoimmunity cannot. Autoimmunity seeks to destroy the very grounds for thinking, certainly for thinking reason. So committed is it to inserting itself as the only possible logos. It is into this aporia and on these very grounds that it becomes imperative to think, to think autoimmunity in its determined unreasonedness, its determination to present itself as not only unreason or against reason, but as, more importantly, beyond reason. Here, Leibniz's dictum is invaluable, and I quote, nothing exists whose, whose sufficient reason for existing cannot be rendered. Again, nothing exists whose sufficient reason for existing cannot be rendered. In other words, Leibniz is saying there must be a reason, and I am extending that to say there must be a reason even for autoimmunity. If autoimmunity is that force which does away with um, so much as the need, a need that is unknown and may even be at the core of the act of suicide, the need for reason, then Leibniz's refusal of the exception, nothing is outside of reason, must be made audible so that the grounds of reason that exist within autoimmunity might be thought. Leibniz will not allow autoimmunity to stand as the sole <coughs> act that surpasses reason, that nullifies any need for a raison d'etre. A reason, even and especially in its unreasonedness, must final words of wrote must be reasoned with. It might be that all reasoning begins, properly speaking, in its reasoning with unreason, in locating the ground for those forces which seem to exist beyond reason. After all, Rhodes' subtitle is two essays on reason. A reason itself must be reasoned with. Those are Derrida's final words in Rhodes. Derrida certainly takes up this project at least part of the way he wrote, as he warns us to, and I quote him, sometimes in the name of reason, we should be suspicious of rationalizations, end of quote. The question that follows from this is twofold. Firstly, can we think of autoimmunity as un autoimmunity, unreasonedness as a rationalization? Would that not suggest that at its core there is something reason at the core of autoimmunity? That autoimmunity is the assembling, hiding something, possibly even trying to hide something from itself, sorry, maybe even unbeknownst to itself. In order to address this, of course, we must think autoimmunity as Leibniz would, as if it is not outside reason, and as Derrida urges, if it, as if it has not yet been thought, as if we know nothing of it. <coughs> and secondly, is it possible to disarticulate reason from rationalization so that autoimmunity might be thought uh, on its own philosophically discrete ground. If autoimmunity stands so intemperately by itself, must not a mode of thought be crafted that begins and retains an unimpeachable fidelity to autoimmunity and autoimmunity only? After all, as Homeland reveals, autoimmunity is vulnerable to itself. Does that make only to itself? Does that make autoimmunity sovereign? Or does that mean if thought from Leibniz's injunction, other modes of susceptibility might be opened up to such thinking. However these questions are approached, this critique of autoimmunity must commence with a contemplation on reason. It is nothing other than Derrida's reasoning with reason that leads into autoimmunity. There may be no prophylactic against autoimmunity, except autoimmunity itself, we cannot say. But neither is there a prohibition against it being subjected to thought, particularly because the greatest threat against the self, against the self in the sovereign state, against the sovereign him or herself, given its Schmittian exceptionality, is autoimmunity. It would be unreasonable to expect anything but a thinking of the greatest threat against the self and the sovereign state, against the sovereign himself. Autoimmunity may be, as Derrida points out, incalculable and incalculable. Its, effect, its effects on politics, sovereignty, culture, the war economy, life itself, but that is precisely why it must be calculated, thought. It is because it is responsible for the anxiety-provoking, quoting Derrida now, 
anxiety provoking turmoil that we are currently undergoing, and a quote that all to immunity must be reasoned and struggled with, thought against, and as itself. Can autoimmunity immunize itself? Can autoimmunity immunize itself against war? The answer to that we should declare no. This is the final section, and they call us terrorists. The use of state power, hysteria, is excessively, is originally excessive and abusive, as is in fact the recourse to terror and fear, which is always the ultimate recourse for the sovereign power of the state, in an implicit or explicit, blatant or subtle form and even when it is contractual and protective. This is the final section, this is me. An American prisoner of war has been termed. The American citizen has become the terrorist, threatening the inside, the sovereign nation against, the sovereign nation that has no defense against itself, against it, its own. In homeland, the threat is in turn emanating from within, and worse, the threat no longer resides in the other, although it might originate there. The threat is located in the self that has been turned by the other into a self that cannot be recognized as other. Apart from Kerry, nobody else recognizes uh, Brody in this way. And Kerry herself is something of a rogue agent. No one, as I said, suspects Nicholas Brody of being the POW has been turned. So he is free to pose as a self. More than that, the returning POW hero is fast-tracked not only to Congress, his party affiliation, not disclosed, but he is handpicked to become the running mate that is the VP candidate for his party in the upcoming election. The autoimmune self has not only escaped for the most part detection, but it is poised to potentially become the sovereign. It is this proximity to sovereignty that paradoxically turns us, turns us to the origins of Brody's autoimmunity, the war in Iraq. Captured by Nazir's forces when he's a Marine, Brody is initially imprisoned, kept in solitary confinement, then physically and psychologically brutalized by Nazir royalist. During his detention, he is tortured, then he is moved into Nazir's home, and then accused by Nazir of having murdered his, pa his partner, an African-American Marine named Tom Walker. It later turns out that Nazir turned Walker too. Finally, in a classic instance of Stockholm Syndrome, Brody develops an affection for his Captor, in part because, as Brody recollects to Kerry, Nazir broke him down and then showed him love. A critical part of this process is Brody's conversion to Islam. The most important aspect of Brody's domestication by Nazir is the relationship that, although it begins in mutual incomprehensibility, they speak different languages, the relationship that eventually blossoms between the American prisoner of war and Nazir's son, Aisha. The relationship is founded on pedagogy, language to be exact, when Nazir asks Brody to teach his son English. After a rocky start, Brody man manages to engage the boy through Aisha's love of football, the main activity engaged by young boys, the young boys who live in Nazir's compound. The first word that Brody teaches Aisha then, appropriately enough, is ball. All this leads to the event. One morning, Aisha, is outside of the compound playing football and an American drone strike, unofficial but authorized by current vice president and former CIA director William Bolden, kills Aisha. As Derrida puts it, state power is by its very nature originally excessive and abusive. Its first recourse is to terror and fear. Until the event, we are sure of only one thing. Brody has been working, but it is the event Aisha's brutal death that turns saliently Brody the surrogate father. It's Brody the surrogate father who goes in search, in search of Aisha once the smoke has cleared. It is Brody, not Nazir, who digs up the boy's mutilated body and carries him inside Nazir's house, sobbing with love for the, the loss of the son that is not his. It is Brody who prepares Aisha's body for its Muslim burial. Paradoxically, Brody cannot show his own son, Chris, again, that, that name itself is provocative, this kind of love upon his return home, even though, as we've seen, he can show that to his daughter. To his daughter. In the aftermath of the drone strike, Brody and Nazir watch coverage of the event on television, which cuts to a clip of Walden denying U.S. responsibility for the event. Open parentheses, and they call us terrorists. 
and the close friends, is Narzir's Twitter indictment film we joined into the television. Violence is the first and most enduring articulation of the sovereign, inscribed as Derrida reminds us originally. The sovereign state, first and ultimately, has no hesitation in seeking recourse to terror and fear. The sovereign state will flout international law in its proclaimed determination to uphold the law to protect democracy. What Homeland maps is the origin of all community. It can be said to begin to have its roots at once within the sovereign nation and outside of it. Autoimmunity is extended beyond the sovereign nation only because the, the sovereign nation arrogates to itself the right to pursue terrorism. This principle applies entirely in Brody's case. It is because of what his sovereign state does outside of its borders, a calculated act it then denies, that the American citizen turns against it and then returns to sow terror in the homeland in much the same way that the event of the drone strike is designed to sow terror among the terrorists. It is his homeland that auto-immunizes Brody, if such a phrase might be permitted. It is his homeland which returns Brody to the U.S. as an auto-immunized figure. The kind of terror that Brody and his associates who come in various guises, TV journalists, rural tailors, rural Muslim tailors, I should say, and even his old Marine buddy, Tom Walker, risen from the dead, they all join Brody in this autoimmune project. The kind of terror that Brody sows in his homeland is of a different order than the, sorry, than the unauthorized, um, unacknowledged violence known as drone strikes that are perpetuated in the, uh, in the Middle East and South Asia, among other places that we know of. If I, citizen of the sovereign state, native to it, turn into my own enemy, what can the sovereign possibly do since all prophylaxis has been removed? The autoimmune self in homeland is of an entirely different order than that Islamophobic sign on Highway 405. It is no longer the neighbor that must be feared, because Marine Sergeant Nicholas Brody is identified, as I said, by Walden, who Brody sorry, eventually murders and thus avenging the son's death as his vice presidential running mate, running mate. In this way, things have changed from 24 to homeland. The occupants of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue have no neighbors they occupy the very seat of sovereignty. If, it is, if the sovereign is the chief report, proponent of autoimmunity, then the task of thinking sovereignty in its relation to autoimmunity is made urgently clear. There is nothing to do but take up Leibniz's dictum. Nothing exists with sufficient reason for existing. Cannot be read. Cannot be read. Or to invoke Heidegger's rendering, nothing, um, sorry, nothing is without a why. And so, in order for the self to make life possible, in order for the self to think its relation to the other as Brody, however insufficiently, however unreasoned his thinking is, the thinking of the autoimmunity auto must begin with the high, with the why that Heidegger derives from Leibniz's delineation of reason. Strangely, it is these necessary turnings, turnings to Leibniz and Heidegger, Brody and Jessica, that turns us back again to Rose which is, first of all, an extended essay on reason with a new question. Is Derrida's thinking, even as he does not explicitly forge the link amongst reason, sovereignty, democracy, and autoimmunity, is his thinking for the reason of autoimmunity? Is that what Rhodes seeks to render? By his own admission, an arresting one with that, Homeland is Professor Obama's favorite show. He acknowledges sneaking off to his office on Saturday afternoons to clandestinely watch episodes of the show. He politely tells his family that he's working. One wonders if he's joined there by a franco mahrebian ghost. Homeland might very well be the television show, The Condition of Political Life, that Derrida anticipated in his last writing in, in Rhodes. If 24 gave us pause with our neighbors, Homeland issues an infinitely more frightening injunction. It is the self you must be concerned with, first, foremost, and last. Thank you.
to fight. I brought out the red fight. First of all, let me thank you for uh, your presentation, which is typically imaginative, probing. And what I appreciate about your work, as many do, is that you consistently substantiate what you're saying with the breadth and depth of your knowledge of theory as well as of um, mass culture, popular culture. In fact, urgent contemporary questions about heteronomy, about self and other, tend to dwell and thrive as we know in academic fields of a certain prestige such as continental philosophy or post-colonial theory, so that drawing the philosophical questions that you pose about heteronomy from two popular television series, 24 and Homeland, is in some respects wicked, which is Trinidad in Trinidadian can be a way to register appreciation for the success of a roguish resource called act. <laughs> Why you, I didn't know if you mentioned at the beginning, is actually, it means rogue, you know, which is the, this, the quotation from, from Derrida that you began. Roguish, because to riff off your opening quote from Derrida's rogues, to rest it on reason, you are in a sense introducing this order into academia. Perhaps all of my questions have to do with the emergence and management of disorder within contemporary American society. So I have a couple of questions. First one is because you begin with television. I'll begin with television as well. The first question has a couple parts. First, you call the character Jack Bauer of Wayu, a rogue, and you describe him as the, and I'm quoting you, the patriotic American who can barely be tolerated by the state's security apparatus. In fact, he all too often operates from outside of it yet is indispensable to the state's project of keeping America safe from terror." End quote. Bauer draws from a long Hollywood and television tradition of the outlaw hero, the unwilling hero who is pressed into service, or at least the hero who performs just actions or renders justice beyond the bounds of legality. Typically, the plot contrives to produce a certain affect among the viewers, a delight in the fact that justice may finally have been served, the delivery of appropriate retribution to the evildoers, etc. So the first part of my question, <clears throat> in the case of Bauer and others like him, the fact that the sovereign state, which is the ultimate authority on whom it relegates to the status of exception, role, of law, is obliged to make use of his services, implies two perhaps mutually contradictory things. One, either the state is at its most vulnerable because it has no recourse but to look at, to its outlaws for salvation. Or two, the state is acting cynically by transgressing the standards of morality that it normally upholds by suddenly, and usually secretly, transforming the outlaw or rogue into an agent of the state. So which is true for you, the vulnerability or the cynicism of the state? Well, that's the, the first part of the question. Um, I suppose the question could also be asked in the following way. Is the utility of the other, that is Jack Bauer, an exception who is internal to the state, right? a menace to democratic ideals of the state, or an acknowledged resource for the perpetuation of state power? Should I give you the second question, or would you like to take a stab at it? Yeah? Um, why don't you find a way to take both? No, OK, it. sure. Okay. The second part of the question. One of your arguments is that Nicholas Brody, the protagonist of Homeland, uh, posits a different set of questions about heteronomy. The other is no longer recognizable. The other is one of us, a self among us, who is bent on destroying the system. The self as an autoimmune uh, subject not simply a suicidal subject, but one whose destructiveness exceeds personal death. The figure of the suicide bomb, for example, but home. 
my question is this, and I think you've been saying it too, but I just want to make sure. Is there not a shift from 24 to Homeland whereby the exterior acquires a different quality or value? That is to say, in 24, Bauer's ability to act outside the law is appreciated as a strategy for empowering the state by other means. In Homeland, the exterior is the source of the tuning of an American agent against America. And there is also an interesting grammatical issue here. Your quotes, an American has been turned, is not an American turns, right? Um, which assigns more agency to the American as he turns against his country, right? An American has been turned implies that a process which can only come from the outside has been applied to him. He is the object of the turning. There seems to be greater ambivalence in this exteriority than the one in 24. Um, so that's the second part of the, of the first question. And um, why don't I have you answer? Because there's another one that I have.
I mean, if you continue to restrict the freedoms of making who you are, there is no protection there. Um, yeah, so you have a second? And the second question you're asking you. Yeah, so the second part of this question. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, and yeah, I, I think I agree. I, you know, I think that, that that notion of exteriority, the key thing for me there is love. Because it's shocking to see this guy. You don't know how broke he can then you see him, because when you first encounter him, he looks like he should be who he is, like, you know, like he's just come out of a cave after eight years, he's emaciated, and then you wonder how he's holding the stage. And then you see him in the compound, right. and you understand what's happening. So that uh, is the explanation for why he becomes who he is. But it's love. You know, it's a stop over syndrome. When you break him down, Nazir breaks him down right. to the extent that he now says, anybody who shows me love, I will, I will commune with you. I will show intimacy with you. But until that point, all he wants to do is be a Muslim and live in the Karma. Right. But the moment they kill Aisha, and the moment they deny killing Aisha, yeah. is the moment that his love for his country is no longer telling. Right. Is, and this is the connection to the second point, to the first point that you asked, which is if the country can say, we ordered those drone strikes, drone can live with them. Mm -hmm. Because then the state accepts responsibility. Yeah. You know, then Brody's, Brody's patriotism is ideologically sustainable. But it's in the moment that the love for his country is refuted, or his country cannot live up to his love, that the love of the other turns him into an autoimmune zone. Until that moment, he's just a Muslim. Right. Right? He's just praying, he's just going about his daily business in the compound. That's all right. But it's the event. The event changes everything. And the event is his, his love for his nation is no longer sustainable. And so what he must do in order to show love to the boy, Aisha, is to take revenge against everyone, which includes his own son right. and daughter. Yeah. I suppose, I mean, but also the point I was trying to make about exteriority is in the case of Bauer in 24, uh, what you have is the exterior is used as that area outside of legality to right. which he has recourse that allows him to be that free, that, free reign. And, and, and defending the state in a certain way, as opposed to, to homeland where you have a situation in which the outside becomes a source of transformation. Right, right. The, the outside acts on. Yes. You know, to be clear, you're right. I mean, it is both a critique of, of, of agency, which is to say, you know, we don't know how it is turned, which is why I pose all that question. What happens in the act of turning? Right. And Brody himself struggles with that. Yeah. You know, how do you, how do you then say, I have, I was not? How do you go to church and pray to Allah at the same time? Same time. Great. Um, which brings me to my second question. Um, actually, it's not a second question I have. It's, um, I want to try out a different scenario to see what you say, of, sort of in light of your presentation. Uh, You've employed Holman's protagonist and his story to interrogate the usefulness of Derrida's critique of autoimmunity, to pose questions about heteronomy after September 11th. Autoimmunity is a term, I believe, that first began to be employed during the beginning of the AIDS crisis. Uh, uh, and Derrida's recruitment of the term from the discourse of biology and medicine uh, and the politics surrounding it to describe social phenomena displays some of the problems that characterize this kind of move. What do I mean by that? We go back to his description of what lies at the core of autoimmunity, which you quote, and then I'll scroll down you know, this, this description. Autoimmunity, the, at the core of autoimmunity is the following. And I quote, this strange, illogical logic by which a living being can spontaneously destroy in an, auto, in an autonomous fashion the very thing within it that is supposed to protect it against the to immunize it against the aggressive intrusion of the other, end quote. Um, first, I find it difficult to maintain that the spontaneous breakdown of an immunological system, right, which may be explained biologically as the result of cause and effect, right, should be called an illogical logic, which is a way of characterizing the same spontaneous breakdown from the social perspective of its irrationality. All I'm saying is that is there irrationality in biology? Right. No. Um, most of all, however, there seems to be a problem of conceiving, this is the part that bothers me more, most of all, there seems to be a problem of conceiving the relationship between interior and exterior. Because 
how does a living being reach in to destroy its immune system? All of that just to say that the vehicle for understanding how autoimmunity functions in homeland might be found secondarily in Brody's plan and actions to destroy the system. The fact that he moves from within the state to its exterior and then back again, though transformed, implies that he's not the entire living being himself that reaches into himself to destroy himself. Rather, he is an agent of the state who has access to both its interior and exterior. He does not appear to be the living being of Derrida's statement, but an agent with, within such a being you know, who has had access to inside and outside. So what I'm wondering is if autoimmunity might not be more evident in the ways in which the state destroys its own democratic principles and ideals, which is what you're speaking, such as in aspects of the Patriot Act or the indefinite detention of enemy combatants in Guantanamo, or the unquestioned use of drones by the president to eliminate unright terrorists. No? This would harken back to my earlier question about state cynicism, right? That Brody should have been turned by uh, the brutality in which his love for the other ended, the drone attack, and not in the final analysis by torture, yeah. seems to be a damning critique of the state's autoimmunity. And even this whole question of love, love comes after the torture, right. you know, so it's not, it's not removed from the torture in the sense that you can torture with the, with the, with the idea of effecting a certain kind of response, but adding love to it perhaps might be the ultimate torture. Yeah. Um, I suppose that what I'm suggesting is a view of autoimmunity that focuses less on Brody as the agent of the state's destruction. The state is not innocent. To Brody, as another example, this time human, of an already destroyed state. Mm -hmm. That is to say, a state that is already putting aside you know, its yeah. democratic principles right. and so on. You know? So what I'm saying is, that, is a difference of focus, right. because I think you're in agreement about you know, how the state destroys itself, mm -hmm. which is the, the, is the live being, right? mm -hmm. the whole being. Um, and so... Uh, yeah. I think I to that. Okay, <laughs> that's it. Uh, okay. That when I wrote this down, I sort of been troubling me this difference between suicide and being in the After I wrote the talk, I wrote this. Um, the thing to remember is that autoimmunity has the structure of a promise. So they both threaten everything and is a chance for everything, which is why autoimmunity is not an end. Mm -hmm. right? So in Brody's terms, I can even call it that if he destroys the US as a Christian onto theology, onto theological, is the possibility for the love that he believes saved and sustained him. Right. So the, the self can both save itself mm -hmm. and it can save potentially autoimmunity. It can save the sovereign state against autoimmunity by sacrificing itself. If he is able in that moment to kill the president, the vice president, everything, then the state collapses. Yeah. And then that's, there's the promise. Something else must take its place. And this other thing that will take its place is Abu Nazir imagining of a, a world built through love. Or Brody's imagining, Brody's taking up of Nazir's project. Because Brody never questions Nazir. Right. right? He never says, why are you killing these other people? Yeah. Right? I mean, which other boys have been killed mm -hmm. with people who love them? Mm -hmm. Brody's utterly incapable of that. Mm -hmm. Right? But Brody believes that if there's love, then the possibility of acting for that love and protecting that love. Right. So the only thing that can immunize you against autoimmunity is love. So, yeah, I think you know, it's, it's that notion of autoimmunity as a structure of promise, both in possible of destroying everything yeah. and the chance to build something. Right. I, I didn't think about it as a chance to build something. Yeah. Perhaps we should open it up and have uh, questions as well. So. <laughs> uh, first of all, I mean, let me thank you so much. I enjoyed the, 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 your reading of the, of the two shows, even though I didn't see them. <laughs> yeah, I read a lot, a lot of them. Uh, and, and to tell you the truth, since September 11, I couldn't stomach a major television radio station. I couldn't watch CNN. I mean, and that's actually the truth. Since that time, and I'm just talking about all the others. I mean, once in a while, I, I do that, and I did that with Arab recently. 
because a lot of people praised it <laughs> as interesting and they admired it, and I was bored and just to go see it uh, and, and judge for myself. So I will do that at least since I enjoyed your presentation. I will try to watch. <laughs> but let me say this I, I really enjoyed uh, the theoretical rigor and, and, and the way you read the text of the two shows, uh, which I'm going to talk about 24 and, and, uh, and Homeland. And benefit a great deal from, from, from all these things. But there is something that I, uh, if I juxtapose your reading of, of, of this, you know, and, and that's the risk always in here, you know, when you read, uh, you know, projects or texts of mass, you know, or popular culture, uh, that you, re you run the risk of reifying the text itself to some extent if I'm using the text. Sorry, if I'm using the word reifying in the right way. And I say this because I just oppose your reading to readings by the other rights people, I mean, who are within the text itself, the Arabs, let's say, or the Muslims. Because the reading will be at the level of the presentation. Right. Uh, which is very important because when you really talk about uh, mass culture, sorry, products of popular culture, you talk about a whole system of packaging. But you also talk about a, a long history of representation, or tropes of representation, which is, you know, when just from listening to you or reading the reviews, uh, the show is just full of those talks, but it's also very formulaic. Uh, from, you know, casting the characters to even, uh, uh, you know, the script itself, uh, to even details uh, which is pointed out in many, many reviews, critical reviews about how the show was, you know, was filmed in Israel and, and, and there was that kind of link in terms of the representation of the Arab within the context of the Arab Israeli and the Zionist representation of the Arab, then also uh, where it is Hollywood, <laughs> typical representation and so forth. So I was wondering um, how do you look at your reading within the larger you know, uh, context of reading this by us, who, as I said, the already use that's I think the concern in terms of really the, the politics of representation, of representation of and um, whether if I make sense. I, I, no, 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 it's at the expense of sounding anti theoretical. No, I'm not. I enjoy no, the, the reading. It's, it's the question that's been asked and critique of being leveled against all men consistently. And I know I have no disagreement with the politics of representation. But here's my reason. This is my, in some sense, this is a refutation of that politics and a pointing out of the costs of that politics. If all you do is focus on the other, you entirely miss the point of the I'm not saying don't make a critique, you know, like of course, but you know, like when it's supposed to be for, you know, people in Lebanon are really mad about this because they say, you know, you pretend this is Beirut and these signs are all in, in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So, at the level of representation, there's no question. Yes, Homeland gets it wrong. And yet, what Homeland gives in instead is something far more ominous. It says, the threat is not the other. The threat is the which is to say, in a very strange way, the other has become empowered and enfranchised to destroy the homeland in a way that the self has never before imagined. It's one thing to, um, to demonize Muslims, and the show does it all the time. Right? I mean, it was, of course, it's an Israeli show that deals with, uh, originally an Israeli show that deals with uh, an Israeli prisoner of war who comes back and, you know, is completely ill at, at ease in Israel. Palestine. So, yes, at that level, the show is completely wrong. But what it does here is say, if you think that Al Qaeda is the problem, you're absolutely wrong. Okay, Al Qaeda may still be a problem, but here's a figure who can destroy you in such a complete way. That you, there's no, res, there's no response or refute, there's no prophylactic against the self. What if the sovereign has been turned? What if the sovereign has been turned? Just imagine that. The man who is the president of the most democratic state, most powerful nation in the world, is an other, is a self who's posing as a self. Is an other. That's, that's, my, that's my response to the people who say, you know, this is about politics representation. I don't disagree, but I do say the following, you're missing the point. You're missing the point of homeland. Because 
If you stick to the politics of representation, you will be stuck at that level and you will miss what has happened. You will miss the fact that Olmed is not 24. And if you think it's just another version of that, then I will say, this is where I will make a case for theory. It's only if one understands the politics of autoimmunity that it's possible to understand, becomes possible to understand who Nick Brody is. Right? And that the state has no possibility. The state has no prophylactic, one, against autoimmunity, and two, against the love shown by the other. That's potent. It's a potent combination. very much too and I have to admit that it's this presentation is making me think about some of these movies that I tend to see in a very uncritical way. <laughs> um, because I think it, the Jason Bourne character and that whole series has elements right. of all of this mean? too. Yeah. yeah. And the one of the things that I do find intriguing about it is in fact the role of the state in all of this. So you see I'm thinking in some of the Jason Bourne swans where he is, um, there's a, a role agency or element within the state and um, they have taken away his humanity in some ways and so he is responding to that um, and he's trying to undo that element. But again, it's a piece of the state that itself has gone broke, right. and there's no questioning right. yeah. of the larger right. set of institutions right. and that make up the state. Right. So that the state, um, and this the question you were asking about whether the state being cynical, there's no room for any of that if the state is an innocent in this larger right. realm in which rogue actors are out there doing these things. And so in a sense, it seems like the ideals are left in place, right. where I think part of what you're arguing here is that the very ideals themselves have been undermined, or are being undermined right. by those who are supposedly responsible for upholding right. the state itself. Yeah. So in, in, you know, to answer that question to agreement, the first response to autoimmunity to 9-11 would not have been the Patriot Act, but the Unpatriot Act, right? Open the borders, right? And there are challenges in you know, the U.S. of the says, if you want to be a Christian nation, then think like a Christian nation, which is to say, let the other in, right? This is the pure basis of telling us, you know, like, what happens when you show love to the other? What happens in that act? Because you know what? It's the other's love that has made you immune. And you see this, you know, you see kind of versions of this in a smaller fashion in Jason Bourne. You know, he always ends up on a beach like James Bond somewhere <laughs> with a very pretty woman. Yeah, yeah. Right? But only after he's fought every element of the state that you're in there. Here, I think, what is so, so troubling and autoimmune about, about, about Homeland is that is, is Brody's proximity and right. the ways in which he cannot be read. Right? You can't represent Brody as any other war hero unless you think of him in what an American has been turned. Unless you have that line, you don't get to what you mean. But it picks up on the point that Sala was making too, that he's the quintessential American self. He is the war hero. Right. He has come back. He has the family, the right. two kids. I don't know if there's a dog in there too. <laughs> no, no, no. There's, there's a best friend who sleeps with his wife. That's why it's close to the end. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but he's also white. Yeah. And I think that's part of the representation that is important here yeah. too. So it's it's you know it's it's like when the the Israeli state talks about self-hating Jews right. and it can't be anything right. worse than right. self-hating Jews. Absolutely. It's the Jew who allows himself to be critical of the position of the state. It's the and Jew who opens himself up to the other, who understands his own or his or her own otherness and the violence implicated in that past. In other words, as Stephen Hall once said, right, you know, if you have had violence committed against you, you must try as best you can never to commit that violence against the other, right? I mean, that's, and that's exactly the story. You know, um, Derrida says, Derrida, the, you know, the, the, um, the Sephardic Jew, you know, says, 
very, very clearly what happens. What happens if you open yourself up to that possibility? Right? Auto, he says, self-critique is the first form of autoimmunity because that's a promise. It is a promise to think. It is the promise to think the self in relation to the other. It is the promise to make the self vulnerable to the other. It is the promise to live with the threat. And that's what love is, to live with the threat of abandonment, alienation, loss, pain, but also love. And I don't mean to sound here like a commercial for Earth, Wind and Fire, but, 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 but I, do think, I do think that's what makes Brody love. And that means a lot right. I mean, it's, it's, if you want to do positive representation, you have to turn it on its head. Right? You can't say, I like you. You could be your neighbor, that's why you know who your neighbor is. But it's almost Socratic, know thyself, right? Chloe, I'm sorry. Sure. Thank you so much. That was really instructive. It gave me a lot to think about with the uh, with two shows that I hadn't actually thought about for a minute. Um, so I'm wondering one real question about Jack Bauer. Uh -huh. Just what do you do with that one little moment where he's turned um, by the Chinese government? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he can, like, where, where does that fit in the... In, the, in, in your the scheme that's that you're... That that's, you're a good, that's a good point, you know. Well, wait, let me ask the second sorry, part, because I'll forget. Um, <laughs> <laughs> end of a long day, so I'll forget. <laughs> so, um, so, right, so how does that fit? And then the the, um, the second thing, I kept wanting to, it might be unfair, right, to extend your first season analysis into the, the second season, right, where, where, in fact, Brody is turned by the U.S. and then let go by Carrie. Right? And so you have the whole, you know, state power and love yeah, thing. Yeah. And so does it end up that, you know, love has conquered all, right? To sound like I don't even know this not even earth wind and fire. <laughs> that's something more mundane than that. Right. But but he's opened himself up, it's turned him back, it saved her, and then not to ruin the second season for anyone. But right, when they're at the border, there's a, this moment. So Canadian what border. at the Canadian border, right, there's this moment. Um, and if not to ruin it, I won't say what happens in the but what, what, what is, is the second season an extension of your analysis in the first season, or does it turn back around? Is it a 180 and, okay. it, and it's doing something else? That, no, it's actually an intensification of it. I'll tell you why. Because when we see the destruction at the funeral, we approach that big event. Right. You know, he's killed Walden, people are gathered there. Everybody's looking at Brody as the suspect. When it happens, Brody's not there. This answers your question about autoimmunity. Autoimmunity is self-perpetuating. Because now we don't know who the other self or other selves are. Because Brody doesn't commit that act. But it's the same kind of act Brody would have committed. We know Tom Walker's dead, right? We know the journalist has fled. We know the Muslim tailor has been killed. We know the, um, the Bin Laden forces, the top-notch guys, they're gone. And remember, it's a kind of Trojan horse situation. Right? They're like, they want them to come. And they attack them, there's nobody there, so to speak. They're willing to sacrifice people. Suicide and its relationship to what they So, firstly, when Brody, Kerry lets Brody go, that's the moment it becomes her show. Right? She says, you have to go, because I love this so much, I cannot do without this, right? I love this more than I love you. That's effectively what she says, go, you be safe. So the autoimmune subject has been saved through love, but saved for what and into what? That's the first question. So, yeah, I think it intensity, the short answer is an intensification. The question about Jack Bahobi in turn is really interesting because it's so brief. You know? So ba yeah, Bahoa, because we know like Jack can only be turned for an hour. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and Jack is so screwed up anyway. You know, that's uh, both uh, Carrie is opposed to, you know, she, she's bipolar and you know, she just takes meds and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, I think it's so brief as to not disrupt the general narrative. But uh, you are right in so far as the seeds of Nicholas Brody are in that episode with the Chinese. Sorry, but just to say one of the things that really is, it also harkens back though to the McCarthy era. Yeah. 
because the biggest fit enemies were the potential internal oh, enemies. Right. That's right. Um, and you had to justify and sanction your own attack on your very ideals right. to root out and ferret out and find all of these enemies that didn't make themselves obvious. The Rosenberg. Yeah. That's right. But what happened, I think the McCarthy era is going to continue. You know, the, in, in, in McCarthy or under McCarthyism, there's always the problems that can be. Right? And, and you, you have due process, and your livelihood is delivered, you're not killed. Here, if you are, and, and there's a ruthlessness. Um, Brody is so willing to protect his own autoimmunity that he will kill a man twice. Because that's the Zeus test for him. Show me your loyalty. You need to kill this guy. He makes Brody believe he killed him, and then Brody comes back in a sewer outside Washington, D.C. And then he really does kill him. Like he's risen from the dead, and then he kills him. So the autoimmune project must end in death, does it? Under, under a moment. You know, whereas under McCarthyism, we can be recuperated. And there was, there was, even then, there was a kind of pushback, at least for people in Hollywood. We saw this, but Elliot Kazan got, a, got a, an Oscar. Yeah, exactly. Some people were just like, we want, we, we, yeah. the memory, the memory of his having turned, right, yeah. turns against him in that moment. And there can be no honor, there can be no forgiveness. So I guess part of it that in this moment where we blithely talk about unending war, right. because it's permanent war, whether just or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's almost as if the state is at this level of vulnerability right. that makes it even more adamant about how it tries to ferret out and defend itself from those internal enemies. And it tries to reduce the cost of, of its own lives all the time. In other words, we don't want to send people over there, we just want to know what it's like. So that, that of course, makes it more not. If you, more and more, not this one, if you, on any given Saturday at work, somewhere between 10 and I think 2 o'clock, drive down 13, drive south, you will see there are like five guys that are there every week, old guys, and they say, stop the drone strikes, stop the drone strikes, right? So even at that, you know, at a really sort of local level, people understand the immorality, or the, the state is drawn into question everywhere. Mm -hmm. But the state is only drawn into question because it has drawn itself into question. It can't, as Brody would say, live up to its own standards, or live up to his standards. And when the state fails, even its rhetoric is no longer sustainable.